What an absolute honor it is to be here, to be standing here and waiting for those closest approach images to come down. I, I can't say enough about how thankful I am that NASA allowed us to build and operate the spacecraft here at the Applied Physics Laboratory. We have a large team, and I just happen to be um, the mission operations manager, but in no way um, am I taking the credit for this incredible journey. I mean, it's, I mean, it's definitely a team effort. We, um, we depend upon each other to each do our, our part and to be the experts in our field. And um, when I stand back this morning and I, I just think, I, I have to pinch myself. Um, look what we accomplished. It's, it's truly amazing that humankind can go out and explore these worlds. Um, and to see Pluto be revealed just before our eyes, it's just fantastic. Um, and I can't wait until we get these images down uh, starting early tomorrow morning. And of course, the signal tonight that, that tells us that spacecraft is healthy and has recorded all that fantastic data. So um, thank you again. Thank you very much. Okay, it's been a great morning, and obviously we still, the story's not over yet, and you're going to hear more about that and what's going to happen this evening. But before we open it up for questions, I'm going to toss this to Alan. Um, Alan, if you can set up, we have video of something that happened this morning uh, with the science team, I believe. Sure. Well, well John and I were over uh, uh, at the building uh, here on the APL campus uh, where the science team is working. The science team uh, assembled at 545 this morning for a chance to see that best image of Pluto and to react to it and to have a little bit of a scientific discussion. And uh, I think we're going to give you a peek into it if we can cue it up. scenes look but it's not behind the scenes anymore you've seen it on this screen and it's it's going viral around the world on Facebook and Instagram and probably every other social media as well and uh, we're very happy to be here and be able to answer your questions as the representatives of this big team and representative of NASA and uh, Dwayne it's all your excellent congratulations okay so we're gonna open up for questions and as Alan said social media oh my goodness the numbers are astounding the world ladies and gentlemen is they're just totally excited, and the, the story's not over yet. So what we're going to do here uh, is ra raise your hand, the media. We're going to start with you. We're going to go to social media, and uh, we're going to try to get as many questions in as possible. So raise them high. I'm going to – last time I stayed over here a lot of times. So let me start out with Joel. Give your name and affiliation. And Joel Achenbach with the Washington Post. Tell us about Pluto. What are we looking there? Is Are there mountains or are there – uh, craters, tell us about what you see. Sure, can we cue that image back up? There it is. Okay, so uh, this image is oriented with Pluto's, uh, with north to the top, uh, and so the, the dark regions that you see are near Pluto's equator. Uh, the planet is about 1,500 miles across to give you a scale. Uh, it's got a thin or a rarefied nat uh, nitrogen atmosphere which you can't see in this image because it's clear, just like looking through um, uh, other tenuous atmospheres. But what you can see in this image, and if it's possible for the folks behind the scenes to actually just make it a larger fraction of the screen, you'll be able to see it. You, you can see regions of various kinds of brightness, very dark uh, regions near the equator, very bright regions just to the north of that, uh, broad intermediate zone um, over the pole, and what we know is that um, on the surface, we see the history of impacts. We see a history of surface activity in terms of some features that um, 
we might be able to identify as tectonic, indicating internal activity in the planet at some point in its past, or maybe even uh, in its present. And what we also know is, is this is a, uh, clearly a world where both geology and atmospheric climatology play a role, because Pluto has strong atmospheric cycles, it snows on the surface, uh, the snows sublimate and go back into the atmosphere each 248 year orbit. Those snows have been observed to move around on the surface, seen from 3 billion miles away. Uh, we look at that image, and frankly, if you're a scientist like I am, you want to see all the supporting data. You want to see the topography that we'll get from stereo so that we can determine what's high and what's low. You, you want to see color data so that we can start to identify the different compositional units. You want to see the composition spectroscopy so that we can determine what those different areas are made from. You want to see the thermal maps so that we can understand are the, the, the brightest areas, the coldest areas, for example, where the snow is, has uh, played it out, or is it some other story that Pluto is trying to tell us. You also want to see higher resolution images. In fact, by tomorrow, we'll be able to show you imagery with 10 times the resolution of that image. And eventually, as the data continues to come to the ground, we'll have imagery that's better still, dramatically better still, in fact. So there's a lot more to teach us uh, with the data that's coming down, and we just couldn't be happier about the performance of the spacecraft, and frankly, about the performance of the Pluto system. Other questions? Here. Emily Lakdawalla with the Planetary Society. Um, I noticed that there's also color information in that picture, so I'm wondering if you can tell me first a little bit about the color data that you got, and also if you see any evidence for atmospheric hazes or clouds or anything happening in the atmosphere that you can see in the images. Sure, absolutely. Could we put up the color image? Is that possible? There's another image that I'm looking for, and if they don't have it backstage, then I'm not able to show it to you. Okay. So... So on the monitor, it's a little hard for me to see, but uh, we know that Pluto has uh, color variations across the surface. Um, when, we, when we stretch those, which is something that our team is working on right now, we'll have a better handle on uh, how strong those variations are, and we expect to be able to show you some of that later in the day. Um, I've looked at that image just very briefly um, when we uh, were first over in the, uh, the science work area, and uh, I was looking for evidence of plumes looking for evidence of atmospheric cases, and Emily, I couldn't see them. That doesn't mean that they're not there. You know, a real proper a proper analysis of it will require some time and maybe higher resolution imagery. Hi. Um, Miriam Kramer with Mashable. Uh, first of all, this is very exciting for everybody, I'm sure. Um, but I'm wondering, specifically for Alice, how are you feeling right now um, knowing <laughs> that... Uh, your craft is out there, you know, flying flying by the Pluto system, and you won't hear it from it for a while. Thanks. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I haven't had very much sleep. <laughs> and, and, you know, we always talk about the spacecraft as um, being a child, a baby, a teenager. And um, we lost... Uh, signal as planned last night at 11.17, and there was absolutely nothing anybody on the operations team could do was just to trust that we had prepared it well to set off on its journey on its own and do what it needed to do. Um, but yet, there were a lot of us in the ops center, even though we knew that that spacecraft wasn't going to be talking to us, um, but we were there. We, we wanted to be with it as it went through this journey, um, and I am feeling a little bit nervous, just like you do when you set your child off, um, but I have absolute confidence that it's going to do what it needs to do to collect that science, and it's going to turn around and send us that burst of uh, data and tell us that it, it's okay. So I guess it's a mix of feeling uh, um, nervous and proud at the same time. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna, before you ask your question and give your name and affiliation, uh, if you can please raise your hand a little high. A lot of folks here in the lights, so we can get, so go ahead. Hi, Stacy Severn, Star Talk Radio. And I have a question from one of our listeners. Um, how long can New Horizons continue to transmit before its power expires? I'll take a crack at that. Um, New Horizons is powered by 
uh, uh, RTG. That stands for radioisotope thermoelectric generator. That's the same kind of power supply that other outer planet and deep space missions that fly too far from the sun for solar arrays to work. Um, that's what the, we all use. That's a technology developed jointly by NASA and the Department of Energy. And uh, the actual power source inside the RTG is the element plutonium, which, by the way, was named for the planet Pluto in the 1930s. So we sent a little plutonium back to Pluto. That plutonium uh, produces heat, and from the heat, thermocouples convert that into DC electric power for the spacecraft. When we launched, New Horizons um, was producing, through that RTG, about 250 watts. But that declines every year as uh, uh, the plutonium decays. And it's currently producing about 202 watts to power the spacecraft and all the instruments. But every year, three less watts. And as that declines, uh, eventually we'll get to a point where we can't operate the primary spacecraft computer and the communication system. We've estimated that uh, that point will be reached sometime in the mid-2030s, roughly 20 years from now. At that point, the spacecraft will be approximately 100 astronomical units from the sun. And so over those next 20 years, uh, if the spacecraft continues to be healthy, um, it could operate and return scientific data, uh, first from a potential Kuiper Belt flyby of a small planetesimal, the building blocks of planets like Pluto. And then we have a chance to go further to explore the deep reaches of the heliosphere like Voyager did, and to do that with much more modern instruments, much more sensitive instruments that are aboard this spacecraft, and, and hopefully uh, uh, return data that um, will really add to the storehouse of what we know about our environment in the solar system, and potentially even to cross that interstellar boundary and start to sample interstellar space with this much more modern instrumentation. Okay, we'll go with the gentleman here. Um, before you ask your question, I'm going to try to get to as many media as I can. If you can help me out here and just ask one question, I'm going to try to sneak a follow-up in, okay? We can get to as many. These folks will be available throughout the day for one-on-one -on -one interviews. So, sir, name and affiliation. Uh, yeah, John Wenz with Popular Mechanics. Uh, I'm just wondering how, when the data comes in, it'll be prioritized. I know there's a prioritization, especially because it's such a slow, almost 56K connection coming back from Pluto. So... How has it been sorted to be prioritized as it comes back in over the next few months? Well, that's, that's actually a, a, a nuanced story. So, uh, so let me start by saying over the next couple of months, the spacecraft, well, for the, for the next couple of weeks, the spacecraft is going to be sending some of the highest priority data back to the ground. But then beginning uh, around the 1st of August, we're going to transition to a mode where the spacecraft is sending uh, what we call our low-speed data sets to the ground. They're not coming to the ground at a lower speed, but they were taken and recorded at a lower speed. Those are easier to, uh, to, um, uh, to plan for. And we chose those to come to the ground first to give Alice and her team a much-needed break from what's been a six-month historic encounter of seven days around-the-clock operations. So we wanted to give them a break, and that's why we're going to send the low speed to the ground in August and September, and then... They're going to crank it back up. We'll start the planning for that in just a couple of weeks. Uh, we've agreed with NASA a long time ago which data sets were first priority, second priority, and third priority, and we'll send them down in that order. Um, initially, we're going to send all of the data down as a browse data set that's, um, that's compressed on board the spacecraft uh, by a, a factor of several so that we can get it down much more quickly. And then... With that safely on the ground, we'll go back and send everything a second time in an uncompressed manner. The entire process that I just described will take a period of 16 months, and so we expect to finish the last of the data transmit in October or November of next year. Okay. I'm gonna take, before, let me oh, just ask Ellen or, or Alice, what is the actual data rate? Because I think 56K is, is much too high. <laughs> yeah, we wish it was 56K. Um, <laughs> Well, we uh, rate step, we call it rate stepping. So as the um, spacecraft gets, as viewed from the ground, higher um, in the sky, and as that uh, ground antenna um, increases in elevation following that spacecraft, we can increase the data, data rate. So at the lowest rate, at to 10 degree elevation in the horizon, we're at about 1,000 bits per second. 
Now, when we transition into a spin mode, we can actually get higher rates. And so at the top of that, so the max data rate is about um, 4,000 bits per second downlink. Okay, we're going to take two questions, and then we're going to go to social media, which is no surprise. It is exploding with excitement. So question, one question, one question, then social media, then I'm going to come over here because uh, I haven't hit the side yet. Good. Hi, Ken Kramer for Northeast Astronomy Forum in New York, where you'll be next year when you have a lot more data back. And we're very excited, and I'm very excited to be here in universe today. My question is about um, the cratering on Sharon versus Pluto. Looks like in the images you released uh, a day or so ago, there were a lot of chasms and craters at, at Sharon. And this image that you just showed here shows uh, maybe one crater. I wonder, um, is, that, is that real? Do you see a lot less craters? Uh, and why would that be? Why is there such a difference between Sharon and Pluto? Thank you. Well, I think you make a perceptive observation that Pluto and Sharon look very different. And we've known that even from the Earth, but now we can see how dramatically different they really are. Um, to my eye, these images show a much younger surface on Pluto and a much older and more battered surface on Charon. Uh, as we can actually put numbers to this by counting the, the craters as a function of their size and compare it to impact models, I hope that we'll actually be able to establish the, the, uh, the ages of different surface units on Pluto and on Charon. As to why Pluto looks so much younger, either its internal engine um, continues to run and there's active processes that are taking place um, or those atmospheric processes are, are uh, themselves uh, covering up the, the, uh, uh, the geology and covering up the craters. We'll, we'll be able to know that when we get the higher resolution data and the compositional data and the other data sets that I, that I mentioned because with those various data sets we can really read the whole story. And it's ambiguous uh, today for a couple of reasons. One, we just got the data. And second, we don't have the supporting data sets to really unravel the whole story. So stay tuned. Okay, let's take a couple of questions, Chris, from social media, and, and uh, two questions that uh, that are reoccurring. What's what's going on? I'm hearing a lot of a lot of buzz on there. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes, Chris Blair at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. As we go through and monitor all the great questions from all our fans uh, standing online with us. Uh, first question is from at Techno Bagos, and it is, does any of the surface features on Pluto suggest possible tectonics? <laughs> I'm not sure. That's an honest answer. Uh, I think we really have to have a little time to work with the data and to actually look at it carefully on a computer versus seeing it on the screen for a few seconds or on the screens over in the, in the, in the science analysis area for just a few seconds. Um, but we're going to have a chance to, uh, to do that today. And I think that by the time that uh, the experts take a look, uh, we can report back to you tomorrow with, with the first analysis. And one more question, Chris. Excellent. Thank you. And as NASA is always encouraging our youth to study STEM, this question comes from one of our younger fans. Uh, from Jessica Lucas, she tweets, my nine-year-old son wants to know how long did it take to build the spacecraft New Horizons? Uh, New Horizons uh, was built in a period of four years and two months, but that includes the design phase as well as the construction and testing. The entire project from the time that we got authority to proceed from NASA until the time that we launched was four years and two months, which, by the way, is pretty short uh, for outer planet missions, even for planetary missions in general. But we were under the gun to make the Jupiter Gravity Assist uh, launch window in early 2006, uh, and we were able to do that, and as a result, we were able to make the encounter today. Had we not made that launch window, we would have had to fly another four years and not encounter Pluto until 2019. So uh, we were very well aware during the period that we were designing and building New Horizons that there was a big incentive to make that launch window, and uh, the Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory team, the contractor team, those of us... Uh, on science and Southwest research uh, responsible for payload development. I think everybody knew that it was very important and you know a lot of people really sacrificed uh, family time, nights and weekends. A lot of other people didn't think that it could really be done, but this team managed to do it and they deserve a huge amount of credit. They not only built that spacecraft and got it launched in, in that um, unbelievably short time, 
Um, but it's worked essentially flawlessly for the whole nine and a half years.